given what we did last time, uh, our goal now, so we have a prime number, n greater than 7. Uh, remember, we want to find an abelian variety A and a map from x0 n to A, such that four conditions hold. So first was that uh, A needs to have good reduction away from N. Two is that A has completely multiplicative reduction at N. And uh, the third was that if you look at the Gal representation on p-torsion, it's just made out of trivial representations in the cyclotomic character. And then the last condition was that f separates the two cusps. So if we can find this, then we prove that no elliptic curve over Q has any rational end torsion. Right? So this is what we're trying to do now. So there's a universal abelian variety to which this curve maps, and that's Jacobian. find such an A, we can find it as a quotient of J0. So we might as well just think of those. OK, and so we know that for quotients of J0n, this first condition is just free. So. And uh, we exp I explained that maybe one or two lectures ago, but the reason was just very easy. Uh, it comes from combining three things. The first is that x0n has a smooth model away from n. And then whenever you have a curve that has a smooth model away from n, it's Jacobian has good reduction away from n. So this implies that j0n has good reduction away from n. And then we showed that any quotient of a, something with good reduction has good reduction. So good reduction passes to quotients. Right? So one is free. And the goal today is to show that 2 is also free. Okay. And so the sort of proof that this is up also comes for free is going to proceed kind of like this, um, but it's a little more complicated. So uh, we're going to first show that x0n has a certain kind of model at n. So the minimal regular model of x0n at n is nice enough. So we're going to show that, and then from that we'll be able to deduce that J0n has completely toric reduction. And then we'll show that that property also passes the quotients.
So most of the work is going to be in this first step. Um, to go from the, the model to the Jacobian, we're going to use a theorem of Fourneau, just as a black box. Uh, and then to get from that to toric reduction, it's just going to be a little computation. OK, so that's basically the plan today. Are there any questions? All right, so I want to start just by taking care of this third piece. So here's the statement. Suppose we have some finite extension of QP. O is the ring of integers. Little k is the residue field. And we have an abelian variety over k. And B is a quotient of A. And the statement is that if A has completely total reduction, so does B. Okay, so here's the proof. Uh, so I'm going to let F be the quotient map. So we know that the isogeny category of abelian varieties is semi-simple. And so that means that this thing has a section up to some inverting multiplication by n. So you can find a map g from b to a, such that if you do g then f, you get multiplication by n, or some n greater than 0. So take the neuron models of these things. And by the universal property of neuron models, these maps f and g extend. And they still satisfy fg equals n, because that holds generically. So that means that if we look at the special fiber now, We have this map on the special fiber like this, induced by f. And that must be surjective, because we have this thing g that composes with f to, to be multiplication by n. And we're assuming that ak is a torus, so this implies that bk is a torus. say on the identity components. I mean, no, it doesn't matter. Torus over k means that over k bar you're some product of GMs. All right, so that takes care of this. So now I want to explain what this theorem of Renault is that's going to allow us to move from the model to the Jacobian. Okay, so let's start with a slightly general setup. Suppose that we have some proper and flat map like this. So then we're going to define uh, the Picard functor, pick x over s, to be the functor. This is going to be the sheafification of the pre-sheaf that sends s prime to pick of x s prime. This is on the FPPF side of, f, on, of s. So when we were talking about Jacobians, we talked about this kind of thing a little. We were thinking then about the case where S was a field. And we saw that if you just 
take this pre-sheaf, it's not necessarily a sheaf, and so it probably won't be representable. It certainly won't be representable if it's not a sheaf. And the sheafification gave sort of the correct thing to consider. So we're just going to make this definition now. Okay, so a theorem, which were no credits to Murr, is that this thing is always representable if S is a field. It's representable by a group scheme. And here we're making no hypotheses on X other than proper and flat. Well, flat's free because we're over a field to the proper. Uh, so in particular, it could be very singular. So, uh, so for over a field, this thing is representable by a group scheme, so it has a, an identity component. So if S equals a field, we can define pick not as the identity component of pick. And now for a general base, we're going to define pick not just to be those sections which live in pick not over each geometric point. So it's the subsheaf of pick whose sections live in pick not on each geometric fiber. So uh, now I'm going to suppose that S is actually the spectrum of a DVR. I'm going to let K be the fraction field, little K be the residue field, and I want X, I'm going to suppose X is a curve. So the fibers have, are pure of dimension one. And I'm going to let XI the irreducible components of the special fiber. So if you look at the generic point of one of these components and its local ring, it's some Artinian ring. If the component is generically reduced, it's just going to be the function field of that component. But if you have no potence in a dense open set, it's going to be bigger. And so di find to be the length of that ring. So the local ring at the generic point of xi. And this is called the multiplicity of xi and x. So Here's a result that Renault approves. And this, I believe, is the, not the same Renault as the group scheme theorem. It's that one's wife. I think the math sign that keeps referring to her is her. But then the article, actually, the title is me, Michael instead of Michelle. But I assume the math sign that review is correct. <laughs> um, so anyway, the theorem says that if we suppose, so I'm going to put three conditions. The first is that x is generically smooth. Second is that x is regular. And three is that the GCD of these degree of these uh, multiplicities is one. So in that case, this pick knot is represented by a smooth group scheme. Uh, and in 
fact, so that's a smooth group scheme over O. And it's actually the identity component in the Neron model of the Jacobian of X. So in particular, this implies that the identity component of the special fiber of the Naren model of Jacobian is just pick not of the special fiber of X. And that's why the theorem is important for us, right? Because we're trying to show that if you take J0n, and you take its Naren model, and you, take, you look at the special fiber, we want to show it's a torus. And so this theorem says that if we can just find an appropriate model for the modular curve, we just have to compute its pick knot over FP and see that its pick knot is a torus. OK? So a lot more is known about this pick functor. Um, I mean, Renault has this whole paper about it where she proves various things and other people have proved other things, uh, but it's kind of a subtle thing. So in general, at least if you're, well, not in full generality, but maybe with a few more hypotheses, uh, but still pretty general, I think maybe just cohomologically flat is all you need. Barton showed that this thing is representable by an algebraic space, but maybe not a scheme. And sort of the problems that come in with showing that it's representable by a scheme is some kind of non-separatedness. Identity section doesn't have to be separated, but if you kill that, the, the closure of the identity section, which you should, you know, think it would be just a point, but if you're not separated, then it could be big. But if you kill that, then it's representable by a scheme, and a piece of that will actually give the full uh, neuron model instead of just the identity component. So there are, there are various, you know, variations on these statements that you can make, but this is all that we're going to need. Why does that come in? That comes in to get the separatedness. I mean, when there's all kinds of counterexamples when these things don't hold. Yeah. You could do it this way, yes. Well, if it's a Jacobian of something, then you can do this. Otherwise, this kind of thing, I don't know if it tells you anything. I don't know if there's, well, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm? Well, the first thing you said is not even involving pig zero, right? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is saying that if you have a curve, then you can relate the model of the curve and a model of the abelian variety. What are you saying? You start with an abelian variety, and then you're trying to relate a model of the abelian variety with a model of what? Pick zero of what? I mean, if you have an abelian scheme over O, then it already has, I mean, there's really not really much to do then. It has good reduction, and it's pick zero will be the dual thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you find a model for that curve first, right? But finding the minimal regular model for an elliptic curve is basically the same thing as finding its narrow model, right? Because the narrow model is an open subset of the minimal regular. No, I mean, well, I don't know because, but I mean, that's a theorem, right? Like if you look in Silverman's book, the way that he constructs the narrow model for an elliptic curve is to first take the minimal regular model and then prove that the smooth locus is the narrow model. 
But if you have a two-dimensional abelian variety, what are you going to do? I mean, what kind of models do you have for those things over rings of integers? It's not nearly as nice. Yeah, okay. I mean, the point here is that if your abelian variety comes from a curve, then since you know how to do things for curves, you can transfer that to abelian varieties. But if you just have some random abelian variety, I mean, what other object are you going to use to get your hands on it? But that's probably harder to find than the narrow model. Uh, yeah, I suppose so, um, but I just don't think that would help you as much as this does. Okay, so now we want to understand models of x0n, so we can apply this thing. We want to actually understand the minimal regular model. So the guess, by the guess that you would make, is that M0n bar, the core space of this stack that we defined over z, is the minimal regular model. It is a flat minimal, a flat proper model of the thing over z. Uh, and furthermore, you can show that the stack is actually regular over z. But it turns out taking the core space is going to screw things up and introduce some irregularities. So this is not actually true. Uh, but it's pretty close. Um, so this thing is, is very close to actually being regular, um, as we'll see. So I'm basically going to take as a black box the statement that this thing is regular. So that's proved in katz maser but I'm not going to prove it today. That would take too much time. And uh, so we're going to go from there and see what we can say about the structure of this thing. Uh, so the way that we're going to approach this is we're going to go to a cover of this. I mean, this is some stacks. So we're going to go to a cover, which is actually a scheme. It'll be a regular scheme. And then this thing we can recover as a quotient. I mean, the core space will be a quotient of that thing by a finite group. So we're going to understand how that quotient works to see what this core space looks like. Okay, so I'm going to switch notation and let write p instead of n. That's easier to think about. And this is going to be a prime that's at least 3, or greater than 3. But I'm going to take l to be another prime. So l is going to be a prime not equal to 0 or plus, plus or minus 1 mod p. Uh, so G, I'm going to let to be the group GL2 of the finite field FL. And the order of G is what? Hmm? Does anybody know? Close. <laughs> okay, so it, it, think of it, it's two by two matrices, so there's two columns and they have to be linearly independent. So the first one is a vector and it can be any non-zero vector in the two-dimensional vector space. So there's L squared minus one choices for the first vector, and then the second vector can go to any one that's not linearly dependent, and there are L multiples of the first vector. Okay. So that's the cardinality, and this factors this is L times L minus 1, and this is L minus 1 times L plus 1. So this is L times L minus 1 squared times L plus 1. And so by our choices, this is not divisible by P. Okay? So uh, I'm going to, we're really only going to be concerned about what's going on at P and everything I'm saying. So we're going to work over uh, Z join, let's say, 1 over 6L for the foreseeable future. No, only, only at P is what matters. 
Okay, so there's three spaces that we're going to care about. Okay, so the first is M0P. This is a DM stack, and it's coarse space. <coughs> That's the one that we really want to understand, and then we're going to use some auxiliary spaces to get a handle on it. So the second one I'm going to call, I'm just going to denote it by this, M0P semicolon L. So this is the moduli space of elliptic curves with gamma 0P and gamma L structure. Oh, maybe I want to also assume that L is bigger than 3 as well. So because L is maybe just L bigger than 2 is enough, uh, that rigidifies the problem. There are no automorphisms of gamma L structures. So this thing is actually a scheme. So. And because of that, I'm going to use this notation as well. And then the last one is M of L elliptic curves with gamma of L structure. Everyone remembers what these things mean. Gamma 0 P means a cyclic subgroup of order P. Gamma L is a ba full basis for the L torsion. So we have a natural map from this one, M0 P L, to M0 P given by forgetting the L, tor the L part, forget the L structure. Uh, and the group G acts on both of these ones. Just by moving around the gamma of L structure. And this thing is the quotient of this by that group action. So the stack M0P is the stack quotient of this scheme by G. And the core space is just the normal quotient. Okay? And these are affine schemes. I'm not using the compactified things here. So if you write this as spec of something, then the quotient is spec of the ring of invariance. That's how you compute it. And that's going to behave nicely because G is primed to P, so taking invariance is going to work well. All right, so this M of L thing, this is a very nice thing at P because the structure is L. This is a smooth scheme at smooth over P. And uh, this one, we already know what the structure looks like at P, right? When we reduced, we got these curves. And so it was not smooth mod P, so it's not smooth. Um, and the same goes for this. So this is not smooth at P. But it is regular. So it's just it's spec of some ring. That ring is regular, even though when you quotient by P, it's not any more regular. So I'm going to use this as a black box. So statements like this are proved in Katz Mazur, so you can look at that for a proof. All right, so uh, I want to start by analyzing the structure of this thing, uh, the local rings uh, at points in characteristic P. It's regular, but it's not smooth in characteristic P, so the rings are still going to be kind of interesting. Okay, so here's the first proposition. So if I look at this thing in characteristic P, uh, then this is reduced in cone Macaulay. And it's uh, smooth away from the supersingular points. And at the supersingular points, it has ordinary nodes.
And by that, I mean the complete local ring. Or maybe the strict complete local ring, so go up to the closure of the residue field. Uh, looks like k join xy mod xy. That's what I mean by an ordinary node. Macaulay means that the dimension, the crawl dimension of the ring is equal to the length of a maximal regular sequence, the depth. So that's just, I'm not actually going to need Colin Macaulay. It's just going to appear in the proof. We need it just for a moment. And the same for reduced, actually. Uh, those are just intermediate things that we need. Okay, so. M0 of PL, we can write it as spec A, where A is a regular ring, and it's flat over Z join 1 over L. Uh, I'll just add that here. It's flat. It's a fact. And so it, in characteristic P, in this space, M0 PL, over Fp is just spec of B, where B is A mod P. And so this B, I've taken a regular ring and killed a non-zero divisor, and that makes it C. Okay, so we have the usual kind of structure in this situation. We have maps i and j that go from m of l to our m0 p l. Right, i is the thing that takes the kernel of Frobenius, j is the thing that takes the kernel of Verschiebel. And then we also have the maps the other way, f and g. Just if you think about isogenies, take either the source or the target. And we have, you know, F i is the identity, G j is the identity, all these uh, identities. And so these, in particular, these two things are closed inversions. Since F i is the identity. Yeah, or maybe F p bar, whatever one you prefer. Okay, so these things show that the ordinary locus in M0 PL is just two copies of the ordinary locus of ML. And in particular, it's smooth. That proves that it's smooth away from the super singular points. And then it's just a fact from commutative algebra that if you have a one dimensional thing like M0PL, which is generically reduced, which this is because it's smooth, and it's Cohen Macaulay, then it's reduced. So M0P of L is reduced because Cohen Macaulay, one dimensional, and generically reduced. Okay, and now the key point is that the maps, so you have these two copies of M of L, which local, I mean, this is a smooth thing, so locally you should think of it as just looking like a line. And they're mapping into here, and they don't meet except at the super singular points. And the key fact is that they meet transversely at the super singular points.
And the reason for that is um, as follows. So uh, suppose that you have some supersingular point. OK, well, let's say that you have x here is supersingular, and y here is supersingular, and i of x is equal to j of y. OK? Uh, so if you take a tangent vector, so say that v is a tangent vector at x, and uh, w is a tangent vector at y. So I want to show that when I push these things forward, that they're uh, not linearly dependent. And the point is that uh, to check uh, that they're linearly independent, I can further map them to the product of ML with ML by f and g. And I'm going to know what the push words of the tangent vectors are there. So well, let me say it this way. Suppose that we had a linear dependence. Alpha i star v plus beta j star w is 0. So if I apply f star, we know that if I, you know, f i is the identity. So when I hit I, this thing with f star, it's just going to be v. And we know that f j is Frobenius. And so that induces 0 on tangent spaces. So we just get alpha v equals 0. That's because fj is Frobenius. And so, and similarly, if we apply g star, we get that beta w is 0. So that shows that these are linearly independent. All right, so that's kind of the key point. And uh, that implies everything. Um, but maybe I'll sketch a proof of why that actually gives us what we need. Uh, so I'm going to let, uh, okay, maybe I'll call it z this point, i of x, which is the same as j as y. So we want to understand the complete local ring at this point z on m0 pi. So I'm going to call that, well, let me call uh, the ring of this guy a. And the ring of M of L, I'll call C. So I'm going to let A be the ring homomorphism from A localized at Z to Cx and Cy, given by I star and J star. Right, this, this is the map on rings dual to the maps I and J from the disjoint union of these two MLs. And so I'm going to choose a uniformizer. Uniformizers, let's say, T here and T prime here. Oh, so I wanted to say that this map A is injective. And the reason for that is we know that this local ring is reduced because we proved that A is reduced. And so it injects into it, you know, the product of A mod each of its minimal primes. And there's two of those. And then A mod one minimal prime maps into here and A mod the other maps into here because I and J are hitting two different components. And those maps have to be injections themselves because you're going from a you know, one-dimensional domain. So it can't have a kernel, otherwise it would kill everything. So AZ is reduced, and this map, and I and J hit both components at Z. Okay, so I'm going to let u be the element of a, or az, uh, given by f star of t minus g star of t prime. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to choose these. Uh, so, I mean, Frobenius is interchanging x and y, because that's how the supersingular points are glued. And I can choose these so that Frobenius of t is t prime of p, 
and for being a C prime is T to P. Uh, so for this, I should work over FP bar, which is fine, because I only care about the strict complete rings anyway. Uh, and so you can get this just by choosing T and then scaling it to make this happen since we're over FP bar. Okay, so if I apply I star to you, here this turns into I star F, which is T. And this is I star G, which is Frobenius. Oh, sorry, I want this to be P. So I get Frobenius um, of T prime raised to the P. Frobenius of T prime is T to the P. So this is T to the P squared. T1. Oh, no, T, sorry. And J star of U. Here I get Frobenius on this guy. And so he said that that was T prime to the P. And here I get the identity map. So that's T prime to the P. And so since T was a uniformizer, it generates this ring. This is a one-dimensional, I mean, this is just the power series ring in T. It's a one-dimensional regular ring. And so this I star of U thing generates this ring. And the J star is zero here. And similarly, you can define V to be the symmetrical thing. So G star of T prime minus F star of T to P. And you get the same formulas. So in, in this notation, it says that A of U is T minus T P squared is zero. And so say that A of V is zero T prime minus T prime P squared. Okay, so if I have anything in the maximal ideal of this local ring at A, then when I apply A to it, it's going to land in the product of the maximal ideals. It's still going to vanish at this point. And so that means that I can express it as a power series in U and V, where there are images down there. So I can write A of F as some power series in A of U and A of V. And this is just, I mean, since A is a ring homomorphism, this comes out. So here F is some power series. And since A is injective, this says that F is a power series in U and V. So in other words, if I look at the power series ring in U and V, it surjects onto the local ring here. And now we know that u times v is 0, right? Because if I multiply their coordinates here, this one is something 0 and 0 is something, and a is injective. So uv is actually equal to 0. And so that means I get a surjection from this mod uv to a of z. But this can't have anything else in its kernel, otherwise it would kill one of the two components. Right? That, that just can't happen. So it must be injective, or it would kill a component. OK, so that means that this complete local ring here really does look like this, and you do have a simple node. That's what we were trying to prove. OK, so this was kind of a lot of calculation, but the point was just that once we got the separating tangent vectors thing, it was just some commutative algebra from there. OK? Are there any questions? All right. So now I want to, this was over FP. Now I want to do this integrally. And so the proposition is that uh, if I look at M0 PL, this is uh, smooth over Z join 1 over L if you avoid the super singular points in characteristic P. And the strict complete local ring.
add a super singular point in characteristic P is of the form W join XY on XY minus P. Where here W is the bit vectors of that P bar. The strict stuff, I just need to close up the residue field because I don't want to worry about the tangent directions being rational or not. Okay, so this thing, you'll note, it, it is a regular ring. We'll see that in the course of the proof. But and when I reduce it mod p, I get a node. So it looks like the sort of thing that you should expect. Okay, so here's the proof. All right, so we already know the statement about it's being smooth away from here. So it's really just that we have to prove. So let me call r the strict, complete local ring at a super singular point. Okay, so we know that R is regular because this scheme is regular, so all of its local rings are regular. It's flat over Z join 1 over L, and it has dimension 2 because it's a curve over a one-dimensional base. And we know what R mod P is. That's what the last proposition did. That's the local ring in characteristic P. So this is just K join XY mod XY. Okay, so by Nakayama's lemma, if I lift x and y back to r, they generate. So we did a surjection like this. All right, so we know that x times y, in, when we reduce my p, is 0. So that means that we have a relation like xy equals p times w for some w in r. And let me just call R prime the quotient. And this, we know it subjects onto R. Okay, so you can, okay, so if you look at this um, ring, and just, uh, so it's, as a W module, it's free and spanned by the monomials in X and Y. And this relation lets you get rid of any basis vector that has both x and y. So as a w module, it's spanned by 1 and the non-trivial powers of x and the non-trivial powers of y. So it's free as a w module. So this thing is already flat over w. So r prime is w plus the sum of w times powers of x's plus w times powers of y. It's flat over w. And we know that when you kill p, if you take r prime mod p, you just get the ring for r. So in other words, this map induces an isomorphism mod p. And so that implies that this map here already has to be an isomorphism. Because we know that r is flat over w. And the point is, if you killed anything else, you'd either be killing something in characteristic p or introducing uh, p torsion into the ring R. Since R is flat, that can't happen. OK. Any questions about this so far? OK. Well, we still have this matter of W. I'm basically saying that you can take W equal to 1. We need to prove that. <coughs> so that's where regularity comes in. So if we look at the, okay, so R is this quotient. The maximum ideal is xyp 
And so if I look at m mod m squared, this is spanned by p and x and y. So it's the vector space spanned by these things. And then the only relation is the one coming from the ideal, that x, y is equal to pw. But x, y is already 0, because it's in m squared. So all we're doing is killing pw. OK, so if w is in the maximum ideal, then pw is already in m squared. And so it doesn't give you any relation in m mod m squared. And so that implies, if this is the case, that m mod m squared is three-dimensional. Right? And that's a contradiction because, 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 huh? Why is it two-dimensional? Yes, R has 12 dimension 2 and is regular. So from regularity, we see that W is not NM, which means that it's a unit in R, which means that we can divide by it. So if we change X to X over W, we can basically reduce the case where W is 1. Right? Any questions? All right, so now I want to go to M0P from M0PL. So remember that M0P is the quotient and so the ring for M0P is the ring of invariance. Okay, so uh, since G is prime P, or the order of G is prime to P, that means that taking G invariance commutes with reducing mod P. And so that means we get the same answer when we quotient character like zero and reduce or reduce and quotient. So there's no problem with interchanging these orders of taking the coarse space or reducing. Um, so we know that minus one in G acts trivially on this space, right? So I'm going to let g bar be the quotient. And that acts faithfully, faithfully on that space. OK, so let me write r for the complete local ring, the strict complete local ring. of M0P at some point X, and S for the same thing at some point Y above X. This, these are in characteristic P. Okay, so you have the set of points above X in characteristic P that's permuted transitively by this group. And the stabilizers correspond, I mean, they're all isomorphic to the automorphism group of X. Points above X are permuted transitively by G bar. The stabilizers are equal to the automorphism group of X. Let me call that group H, or sorry, it's this mod plus or minus. I'll call that H bar. Okay, so if you think about it, that means that this ring R is the H invariance of S. I mean, the point is that 
if you look at the local ring here at this point x, I mean above all points x, it's going to break up into a sum over all the points y of the local rings at those various points. And then g is going to permute those around. So when you take invariance, it only matters about what one of them are. And then it's going to be the invariance of the isotropic group of that thing. OK, so r is the h invariance of this s. And so now, what is this h? So there's three possibilities. This is a basic fact. So So uh, if the j invariant of x is not 0 or 1728, then h is trivial. So this is just a fact about elliptic curves and characteristic p. So we have an elliptic curve and characteristic p. Remember, p is not 2 or 3. I'm assuming p is bigger than 3. In that case, the automorphism groups are always z mod 2 or z mod 4 or z mod 6. If your Jane variant is not one of these two, your automorphism group is always just plus or minus one. We're killing that in h bar. So if your J is not this, then necessarily your automorphism group is trivial. Uh, if J is 1728, then it's possible that your H is Z mod 4 and H bar is Z mod 2. And if J is 0, you can have z mod 4. Or sorry, z mod 3. So at the points where h bar is 0, we just get r equals s. And we're done. I mean, at those points, I mean, if, if you're at an ordinary point, we already know that s is smooth and, and r is going to be smooth. And if you're at a super singular point, we know that s is regular. And so you'll still be regular there. So the only problems can happen at the points where j is 0 or 1728. OK, and so at those points, you have some possibly bigger stabilizer group. And since you know, the, the, the stabilizer is discrete, so this group has to act non-trivially in the neighborhood of these points, which means it's going to act necessarily non-trivially on s. So if h bar is not 0, it acts non-trivially. And so now if we think about the cases, there's just a few cases. So if j of x equals 0, and our h bar is z mod 2, well, it could be that this point is ordinary. That's possible. So in that case, since we have an ordinary point, our ed, or, you know, we're smooth at s. So at this s ring is just going to be something like this. It's one-dimensional smooth, two-dimensional smooth ring. And this z mod 2 z is acting non-trivially. So h bar is just going to act by x goes to minus x, if you choose x appropriately. And so that says that the ring of invariance is just x squared, which is isomorphic. So that's, again, smooth. So you don't get anything bad happening there. So if x is super singular, then we know that s is w adjoin xy mod xy minus p. And if you choose x and y appropriately, this h bar is going to act by sending x to minus x and y to minus y. And so then the invariance by this h are x squared, xy, and y squared. But we don't need xy, because that's p. So let me call this one capital X and this capital y. So this shows that in this case, r is generated by capital X and capital y. And the relation that they satisfy is x times y is p squared, because big x is little x squared. And then when j is 17, or maybe I mix these up. Yeah, when j is 0, then you get z mod 3z. And it's going to be the same thing here. 
this would just be a cubed, but it's still regular. And here you get p cubed. Okay, so let me summarize what just happened. So let x be a point of M0P in characteristic P, and let R be a strict complete local ring. So then there's four possibilities. If x is not super singular, then x is a smooth point. And so this R is just of the form that. Uh, if it's super singular, but its J invariant is not 0 or 17.28, then uh, x is a regular point, and r is w equals xy, minus xy equals p. So it's not a smooth point, but it's a regular point. If x is super singular and its J invariant is 17.28, uh, then R is W join XY mod XY equals P squared, which is not regular. And if it's zero, then it's the same thing with the cube. Okay? And actually, I've just been doing M0P, but we already know what happens at the cusps. So the cusps are smooth points, right? So if we just think about that picture in characteristic P when things are getting glued together, the cusps are away from what's being glued, so they're fine. All right, are there any questions about this? So this is really just computing these, you know, invariants finding what happens for the local rings in your scheme and then computing these invariant subrings and finding out what happens. Okay, so this thing, M0P, this shows that it's not regular. But it only has a few points at which it's not regular and the singularities are very mild. And they're very controllable. They're just things like this. And so you can resolve these just by one or two blow-ups. And what happens is if you take this one, so this is similar to, to the uh, computation that we did before. Uh, Remember when we were talking about Nairn models for elliptic curves, I computed what happens when, when you had multiplicative reduction in one situation, and it was an equation somewhat similar to this. And what happens when you do this and you blow it up, you just introduce an extra P1 at this point. Right? So in characteristic P, this thing already looks like two P1s crossing, and when you blow it up, it just is going to inflate this intersection point to another P1, so it's something like that. And here you add two P1s. So the result is that you add p1 at j of x equals 1728, x is super singular, and a chain of two p1s. At j equals zero, if x is super singular. So m0p, I mean, the, sort of schematically what it looks like, something like this, right? Here's two P1s and they're glued at, let's say, these three super singular points. And then what happens is that we're just, if you look at the minimal regular model in characteristic P, let's say that this thing was J equals zero, we're just adding another P1 there. So it's just gonna look like that. Now you have three components, um, but they're all still eating transversely. Okay, something like that. Okay?
So the special fiber of the minimal regular model is not necessarily, I mean, it's not irreducible, <coughs> but you just have, all the components look like P1. And it's still reduced, and the crossings are still just nodal singularities. And so the special fiber of the Naren model, thanks to this theorem of Renault, is going to be pick of this thing. So we need to understand what pick of that looks like. And that's some nice thing, so here's the answer. All right, so let's say that K is a curve over an algebraically closed field, K. And let's suppose that C is reduced, that all of its irreducible components are P1, or P1s, and also that um, all of the crossings are transversal. So uh, only simple nodes as singularities. then pick naught of x over k uh, is a torus. OK, so I want to sketch a proof, just the main ideas. All right, so the picture for C is something like this. And we want to think about line bundles on this thing. So if I have a line bundle on this, I can restrict each irreducible component and make it a line bundle. And each one of those looks like P1. And the line bundles on P1 are what? O n, that's right. There's just a z of them. There's no pick naught for P1. OK, so I get there's a, a one integer parameter for each irreducible component. And then at these points where they touch, I just have to sp specify an identification between two fibers there, which you can just think of as an element of GM. So you can say this nicely by introducing this combinatorial thing. I'm going to let gamma be the graph of C. So the vertices are the irreducible components. And you put an edge for each um, point where they touch. The edges are the singular points. And so we're saying that a line bundle gives an element of z to the set of uh, vertices times gm to the set of edges. So again, the z to the vertex set is just taking the degree of the bundle on each irreducible piece. And the gm to the edge set is just the identifications at the kissing points. And conversely, if you have anything there, you can build a line bundle just by doing this gluing. And so that says that pick not is a quotient of this thing, which already proves the theorem. Uh, but you can say a little more. There's a kernel. And so I'll just say what that is. So the question is, when does something in here give you the trivial bundle? Right? We have a recipe for taking something here, giving a line bundle. When is it trivial? Well, it better be trivial in each irreducible component. So the z's have to be zero. And so now you have these GM gluings at each point and the trivial bundle in each component. And the question is, when can you build a non-zero section? Well, a non-zero section is just going to be, I mean, a section of the trivial bundle is a number. And it's a non-zero, so a non-zero number. So we want to assign a non-zero number to each component. And then it has to respect the gluings. So that means that if I'm gluing here by the number A, and here I put the number B on this component, and here I put the number C on this component, then A has to equal B over C. That's the gluing condition. And so if you think about it, we have this graph, where here are the irreducible components, whatever it looks like. And we already have numbers assigned at the vertices. So there's a number here and a number here. These are the gluings. And we're saying that it's trivial if you can put numbers on the edges so that at the vertices you get the differences of the numbers on the edges. So that's exactly what a one co-boundary is if you think about simplicial cohomology. So the actual pick knot is going to be H1 of this graph gamma with coefficients in GM. And just think about the simplicial homology just in terms of putting elements of the group and doing a quotient. And so this is a torus and its character lattice is H1 of gamma with Z coefficients. So that tells you the actual rank. 
question. Oh, I mean, how do you do that in how do you do it in simplicial homology? I mean, this is the kind of thing that comes up whenever you do check homology or simplicial homology. You have to pick some ordering or something. Okay, so. We've now proved this theorem that J0n has completely multiplicative, completely toric reduction at n. And just to remind you the proof the minimal regular model of x0n has a special fiber, which is just p1s with nodal singularities. And then a little computation that we just did implies that pick not such a thing as a torus, and then Renault's theorem implies that this pick knot is the special fiber of the Naren model, or the identical component of it. Right. Any questions? All right, so at the last five minutes, I want to prove something completely different. So this was uh, something that we used the last time. So last time, we kept using this fact that uh, torsion injected in the reduction map in certain situations. And I looked back, and I actually didn't prove that in all cases. So I want to give a complete proof so we have that. Uh, it'll just take a second. So the statement is the following. Uh, we have finite extension of QP with ramification index less than P minus 1. O is the ring of integers. K is the residue field. A is an abelian variety over K with no hypotheses on the reduction type. And script A is its neuron model. And then the statement is that the reduction map on the torsion points here, the torsion points in K, is injective. So last time we were using this a lot for um, elliptic curves. We only needed it for elliptic curves. And I think in the past I'd actually only proved it in the case of good reduction, maybe. Um, but it holds in this generality. Okay, so the proof, I'm going to let G0 be the torsion group of, of A. So I'm thinking of it as a closed subgroup scheme. And if I think of it as a group scheme of respect K, it's constant. It's just taking K points. And then I'm going to let G be its scheme theoretic closure in the neuron model. And we know that this is a flat and quasi-finite group scheme. Okay, and then there's two key points. The first one is that G is actually finite. And the way that you can see that one way is to use the evaluative criterion for properness. So you just have to check that DVR points over fields extend to their DVR rings. And all the points of G are K rational, so you just have to check for the K points. And every K point of G extends to an O point by the narrow mapping property. That implies that G is 
finite over O, and since it's also quasi-finite, sorry, that makes it proper, and since it's also quasi-finite, it's finite. Okay, so G is a finite flat group scheme over O, and now the second key point is Renault's theorem. So G is an extension, or I call it a prolongation of G0, but G0 is constant, so it has another prolongation, the constant one, and so Renault says that those two must agree. So G0 prolongs the constant group scheme. So that implies, by or no, that G is constant. And so since it's constant, the reduction map is injective. In fact, an isomorphism. I think it just, I mean, the scheme theoretic closure is the image on the map of coordinate rings in the coordinate ring of G0, which is some finite dimensional k vector space. And you just want to say that that image is closed under co multiplication, right? I mean, if you have, if you have a map spec A to spec B in the affine case, the scheme's threaded closure of the image of this map is the spec of the image of BA. Right? And so, well, if we pretended that our neuron model was affine, it has some coordinate ring. We have this map from the coordinate ring of G0. I mean, G0 goes into A, so you get a map the other way on the coordinate rings, and you're just taking the image, and that's the scheme threaded closure. The coordinate ring of G0 is some finite dimensional k vector space. The image is some subring, and you just want to check that that subring is closed under co multiplication. Um, I don't remember offhand the proof, but. Oh, um, it might be obvious. I don't, I don't remember offhand. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? <laughs>